Welcome to Health IQ. I'm Dr. Alan Siegel. We have a very special guest today, Michael Schwartz, orthopedic sports medicine specialist with White Plains Hospital. Michael, thanks for having being here today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. My so, pleasure. So tell me about your specialty, orthopedic sports medicine. I know it's very encompassing, has a lot of different nooks and crannies to it, I'm sure. So tell me what you uh, focus on. Well, you're right about that. In general, sports medicine, we can uh, try to simplify it and say we work with people who are athletes, but really most of the people we work with and try to help are people who are just active. Maybe activity medicine might be a better word, but not as catchy. It tends to be that we focus on uh, different joints, particularly ones that are injured in different activities like shoulder, elbow, knee, ankle. Definitely a lot of emphasis on the shoulder and the knee. And all age groups, I would assume. Absolutely so. all age groups. Good. Young kids, yeah. high school, college athletes, your weekend warriors. And as we know, there are many people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who are still quite active. Right. So people that are just staying active in their lives, they're going to have injuries, whether they were a former athlete of some kind, they're still trying to maintain their you know, general weekend activities, or you know, guys in their 80s and 90s still playing golf and tennis and other activities. What are some of the more common injuries that you're seeing, you know, in different age groups, uh, adolescents, you know, high school athletes, and then up to like, you know, your weekend warrior types? Well, it definitely can vary, and we do see some patterns on age groups. In the teenagers and younger athletes, we typically will commonly see in the knee a lot of uh, ligament injuries, particularly the ACL, that's a popular one because it's a very important ligament in the knee, and also some meniscus injuries. Uh, a lot in, of soccer players, I guess, come in absolutely, <laughs> with a lot of yeah. those injuries, right? Soccer, basketball, football, right. very popular sports with a lot of pivoting and cutting motions required from the legs. That's what the ACL does, and therefore it's uh, very prone to injury. Okay, so a patient comes in and they have an injury, whether it's uh, an ACL sprain or maybe they've fully torn uh, a ligament, or you know, we know there's a lot of different uh, ligaments in the knee. Uh, there's also the meniscus that you have to you know, look at. So you'll evaluate the knee, an MRI usually would have to be ordered on all these patients or uh, it depends on how they're presenting. Good question and I get asked that a lot by not only the patients but sometimes the parents if they're a younger patient. And it's up to us, us clinicians to evaluate the patient, do certain physical exam tests and if our index of suspicion is high enough uh, based on the injury and how the knee examines in the office, that's when we choose to get an MRI. It ends up that there's a high percentage of people with such injuries who do uh, end up getting an MRI, which often will show some findings. And MRI is kind of still the gold standard for you know, your specialty, I would think, for evaluation for a lot of these patients. Uh, yeah. Definitely true, yeah. and especially you allude to in my specialty of sports medicine, we tend to treat a lot of what we call soft tissue injuries. So in addition to people who have broken bones, which are common, we look at what's called the soft tissues, the non-bone structures like tendons, ligaments, and cartilage. And those happen to be structures that are very well visualized on an MRI, not so much in an X-ray. Okay, now we were talking about the knee, so we'll, let's just stick with the knee for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, a meniscal tear with a patient. Um, when, when kids are playing on these different surfaces these days, you know, grass versus turf or other things, there's a lot of controversy if the footing or the footwear has a lot to do with possibly, you know, being more of an adversary to their, to their knee if their injury risk goes up. Uh, do you have any comment or any concerns about that? Like, should they be wearing certain types of cleats for certain types of surfaces and is there a higher incidence? of injury for a knee with the torquing and the twisting like a lacrosse or a football player or a soccer player on different surfaces? Well, I think the bigger risk factors are not so much the surface, which probably plays a role, but it's more in the particular sport and also in the conditioning of the leg of the particular athlete, as well as the position their leg is in at the time of the injury. But getting back to the conditioning of the leg of the athlete, there are some protocols out there for athletes to precondition their leg muscles to decrease the risk of these injuries. And studies have shown a positive correlation in doing these exercises. It's mostly focusing on improving what we call neuromuscular feedback. And if the muscles in the leg can react properly and instinctively to a force that is put upon them, 
that's the best thing to decrease the risk of these injuries. Um, to a lesser extent is the surface and the cleats. Right. Still important, right. but that's probably key. So, so all that conditioning that, that is so prevalent these, these days truly mm -hmm. is uh, so important. I mean, an injury can occur with a significant trauma that just wasn't expected, just bad place, bad time, bad position. However, yes. the better condition of the athlete, the, there's definitely a, a, a reduction uh, of risk or a percentage of risk uh, based on studies that I guess you've, you've been you know, uh, researching. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really good. A lot of doctors don't talk about prevention as much these days, or, or maybe there hasn't been in the past a you know, prevalence to you know, talk about prevention. But I think that's, that's very refreshing that you are starting to discuss this with your patients, uh, get um, them to understand that their training is just as important as preventing an injury as you know, if they already have had an injury. So do you uh, have people conditioned pre or post-surgical to help with their recovery if they are actually a, a surgical candidate, depending on what, what the injury is? Absolutely. Right. Critical part in any injury recovery, and if the injury requires a surgery, then rehabilitation is an essential part of, of the recovery. And to get back to sports safely to prevent the re-injury, it's absolutely required. Uh, very few people can get away with not doing that. In fact, in terms of injury prevention, there are now in the forefront some national initiatives uh, coming from some of our national organizations, including the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. There's a, uh, a lot of input um, and try to, uh, community outreach uh, to all the communities throughout our country to decrease the incidence of these sports injuries. We are seeing an epidemic throughout the country, a lot of it because not so much, not as enough conditioning, which there always could be more, but we're seeing a lot in the youths, whether it's below the age of 10 or teenagers and above, a lot of focus on doing the same sport all year round. There's a lot more opportunities and avenues for uh, children and adolescents to be involved in sports, right. uh, which maybe we didn't have when we were yeah, younger. So repetitive and stress to the same areas absolutely. and things of that nature. So you're seeing a lot of that. Yeah, we, yes. uh, we've discussed this a little bit on some mm -hmm. some of our shows because it is such a prevalent thing. And I think, you know, doctors are seeing this over and over again, where you know a kid or you know even a college uh, student is doing the same repetitive o motion, and they're not taking the breaks or the rest that the body may need. And you know, you and I may have played different sports or did different things throughout. You know, our you know, adolescence, but now kids are doing one thing all year round, using the same body part over and over for, you know, if you're a pitcher or, or other other specialties. So, so let's, let's talk about the shoulder for a minute. So, you mm -hmm. know, shoulder's a very complex joint, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it's your more prominent uh, injury related to the knee, but there's obviously many injuries, especially as we get older. Um, what are the most prevalent, you know, injuries that you do see in the shoulder and what, what types of procedures are you doing uh, uh, as needed for those injuries? Well, I do agree the shoulder complex joint, not to take anything away from the other yeah, joints, right. <laughs> uh, but there are some anatomic um, specificities about, uh, right. uh, about the shoulder that make it very interesting. Um, and it's very age dependent what we see. So typically in the younger uh, athletes or active people, uh, we're seeing injuries often related to throwing or overuse, and it usually has to do with instability of the shoulder. So shoulders with certain sports can become quite use, uh, excuse me, loose. And with... Uh, so like a ligament laxity, is that what yeah, you're so to? Yes, so ligament okay. laxity. Yeah, okay. um, and sometimes from a, a single injury episode, like a dislocation, those are relatively common in younger athletes who maybe do higher energy sports. So we're seeing problems with instability where people either dislocate their shoulders or more subtle or more complex, their shoulders may be sliding around more and partially dislocating what we call subluxating, subluxating. but they may not notice it. They just right. It just translates into pain. And that's a, an interesting phenomenon. You mentioned throwing and pitching and a lot of pitchers who overuse with that will have a similar type problem. Right. And is that usually a surgical case, or is that more of a rehabilitative case, or is it a combination of rest, rehabilitation, strengthening, uh, stabilization of the joints, things of that nature, or a combination of different Well, approaches? all of the above. Yeah. We yeah. try for the majority of uh, patients in these situations, particularly with the overuse injuries, to do the rest, so we lessen the, the inciting problem, the overuse, and then channel into rehabilitating the shoulder, working on certain muscle groups that were maybe 
did not get as much attention. We can often analyze and look at imbalances in the shoulder. Uh, some pitchers, for example, they are amazing to get their arm w actually rotated way back, which I can't do, but if I could, right. I could probably Media, throw it 90, yeah. <laughs> 90 miles an hour. <laughs> right. But then they can't bring it forward right. that much, and it's quite an imbalance that puts a lot of the internal structures um, under stress, particularly something called the labrum. So if we can get these yeah, A lot people of people hear about the label, label mm -hmm. tears. They don't necessarily know what it is, though. They, they, do you want to go into that a little well, bit? Let's like, talk about yeah, that. Let's start with the mm -hmm. labrum, yeah. So the labrum is a very important structure deep inside the shoulder. It's actually, people think of it like a ligament, but actually it's a special type of cartilage and it provides some micro stability to the shoulder. It helps keep the shoulder, which real simply is kind of a, a ball in a saucer joint right. and the ball rotates around. That ball should stay perfectly centered in the saucer throughout an entire range of motion. If you have an overuse or one-time tear of the labrum, the ball, called the humeral head, will not stay perfectly centered and if you try to move your arm in a position, that can incite uh, considerable pain, which would certainly limit activities, including so throwing. So it's, it's a stabilization piece of the jo of the joint, essentially. Yes. yes. Okay. So and so, when someone does tear their labrum, is mm -hmm. there is there any option, or is it a surgical case in a lot of cases, or you know, or it depends still. Certainly a case yeah. by case yeah. basis, and it certainly needs to be taken in the proper context. So that's why if I see people who I'm suspicious if they have this problem, right. or they come to me, let's say, with right. an MRI that shows it, sure. we want to know what type of symptoms someone has, and if they sound consistent with someone who has a labral tear or this micro instability I was referring to. And then we want to know if any rehabilitation has been done. We can try on the overuse injuries to rehabilitate the shoulder, get the shoulder in proper motion balance, and get the muscles in proper balance. And sometimes that is enough to take the pressure off of the joint, off of the part that has the damage, and we might be able to get someone back to their goals of whether it's throwing or whatever other activity uh, that they Does may want to do. Does it ever repair itself? Is it something that actually can repair itself? It just stabilizes, and, and, and like if you ever do an MRI, keep showing that's torn, but maybe there's no pain associated with it. Like sometimes they'll they'll see findings on a meniscus or something. Well, it didn't really heal, but you're not in pain, so we'll leave it alone, type of thing. So well, certainly uh, you hit it on the head right at the end there. It, it may if it doesn't heal, but if you're not having pain and you can do your activities, how much better can we get than that? Right, you just so, leave mm -hmm. good enough alone sometimes. Right. Yeah. Now it's the exception that these type of tears heal. Um, not exactly the rule, but it can happen, and it does happen, but usually it's in the smaller tears and ones that are not displaced or separated from where they belong. And what's the surgical procedure to mm -hmm. deal with that? What would you do if you had to mm -hmm. do a surgical procedure for that? So for that, we approach it arthroscopically. Okay. And so uh, that's, that was part of my training, part of what I focused my clinical practice on. So some people may have heard of the term a scope, if you've yes. heard that, and that's just a colloquial or abbreviated way of saying arthroscopy. And it's a minimally invasive procedure. We use several incisions that are relatively small, about about that big, I'd say, so less than half an inch. Right, and we're going to show a little video about mm -hmm. that here, so you can keep describing that um, mm -hmm. procedure. Um, so what happens uh, once you're inside the joint there? So what we do, several of these incisions are placed around the shoulder in locations based on which part of the shoulder we're trying to, to work with. Okay. And, and one there's of actually the, a camera. There, there is a camera. Yeah, right. So through one of those incisions, we place a, a mini camera. It's a long and thin instrument. goes through the incision. and the end of it, there's a camera. And the image that's now from inside the shoulder, that gets projected on a, a big TV screen that we're looking at the whole time. And it's uh, nowadays with advances technologies, it's high definition with a big flat screen TV. So we can see lots of detail. So it's very detail oriented. Yes. And, and, and the scope has been around for a long time as, as we're kind of watching this little video here. Yes. It has been um, uh, around for what, a couple of decades now. Yes. But, but the technologies, I would think, have gotten greater, 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 making it that much more specific, that much more detailed, as you said, and that yes. much more. Uh, a, a true tool for, for a surgeon, you know, to use in their, in their practice. Yes. Yeah. When we first started arthroscopy, like you said, several decades ago, we could mostly look around, maybe clean up a little bit. We can do a lot more now. Right. We can uh, repair all different types of labral tears, other causes of instability. We can 
repair rotator cuff tendon tears. Right. Uh, there, there are and well, that's a whole other many, a whole thing other topic. Yeah, a whole other topic. Right. <laughs> but there are many different things right. that we can do with the arthroscopes. We and, can and, actually do work. And they're inside. considered at this point. That's is minimally invasive or as, yes. as minimally invasive as you can be in the surgical realm, you yes. know, as things are improving uh, to uh, not affect the, the tissues around the area that you're trying to focus mm -hmm. on, whether if you just want to go and do, a, like you said, a rotator cuff tear or a tendon repair or deal with the labral issue or maybe clean out a little bit of uh, like a, you know, downward sloping acromium, you know, mm -hmm. things of that nature. You, you can get pinpoint to where you want to be without affecting the muscles and the tissues around that area. So the recovery time on the scopes is pretty, you know, not quick, but they're quicker than they, they used to be. You can pretty much get back into what you're doing in reasonable amount of time based on factors, but usually uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. That's been one of the most significant advances, but not the only one or advantages to uh, performing these surgeries arthroscopically. A lot less tissue trauma. We don't need to basically cut through muscles and tendons to get deep down into the shoulder. We can bypass them and through these small incisions. So that has translated into these can now be outpatient procedures. People can go home the same day and they have much less pain, so much less requirement on strong narcotic pain medications. Right. And in practicality, people are able to get back to life and work and their life right. responsibilities sooner. In addition, another advantage is that we can actually do more work in a shoulder or any joint arthroscopically than we can through the open incisions. Because an open incision is kind of like looking into a tunnel, and the further away you are, the less you can see. Right. Whereas when you're in with the arthroscope, you're actually inside looking around the whole room, and you have access to right, reach so It opens the up whole the, whole, the whole surgical mm -hmm. area for you, so you yes. can really see like almost 360 in, in some, I don't know how good yes, these cameras are, but they probably, are. Or you, you can, we can maneuver the uh, scope mm -hmm. around. Yes. So that's interesting. So, so that's one level of sports medicine. Now, mm -hmm. now we start getting into, okay, somebody's a little bit older mm -hmm. and their joints may be just wear and tear over the years, uh, traumatic injury, whatever, whatever it is, and their joints just not in good shape. It's chronically in pain, you know, bone on bone, you know, the cartilage is gone, the tendons are ripped. You know, at what point, you know, people may not be aware that there's actually shoulder replacements. You know, I, I know everyone hears about the hip because it's more mm -hmm. common. They hear about the knee, it's more common. Ankle, less common. Shoulders, <laughs> maybe in between. Yes. Uh, you know, tell me about what's going on in that part of your uh, specialty in terms of actually having to replace a shoulder on a maybe a 60, 70, 80 year old person or maybe even younger depending on what's going on with them. So. Okay. Well. So certainly, in addition to the other uh, yeah. <laughs> things we could do to treat the shoulder, shoulder arthritis is a, is a problem. And, uh, and a good number of people have it, like you said, not as many people have hip and, and knee arthritis, uh, which gets a lot more attention. Right. And I see it in various age levels. Uh, most commonly, it's people 40s and above, but most typically 60s and, and 70s, uh, but certainly in between. And depending on the amount of wear, we have different options. Now, with arthritis of many joints, we usually do try to start with the non-operative managements, which they do not cure the problem. We cannot regrow that worn cartilage. That's one problem with cartilage, which is a wonderful right. tissue in our body I to think, help our I joints think every, move. every part of your specialty is waiting for that magic way to regrow yeah, cartilage. You know? that would be <laughs> terrific, you know, and we are working you know, on yeah, it. Yeah, I know there's a lot of you know, research out there <laughs> yes. with you know, st uh, stem mm -hmm. cells and things of that nature mm -hmm. and growth hormone, et cetera, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we're, we're replacing joints, so, so we'll talk so, about what we're doing currently. <laughs> uh, so with that, so we have different options. Yeah. And uh, I'll start with the more typical is a total shoulder replacement. So not that much different from a total hip replacement, but when you have, as you alluded to, bone on bone, that means the cartilage is worn off. I mentioned before the shoulder, a ball, and a saucer. Well, normally it has a coating, a Teflon coating on each side, and it acts like a nice lubricated ball bearing joint. Well, once that's worn off, it's bone grinding on bone. That translates into pain, a lot of stiffness, and I see a lot of patients who really ignore it for quite some time, a lot more than hips or knees, probably because we don't have to walk on our arms. Right. Um, that said, it could be very painful, very debilitating. Right. And you can't sleep on one side, you can't absolutely. do anything with your mm -hmm. arm. It's like, 
you know, it's difficult. It's you know. that's what I see. Yeah. <laughs> and so our non and the pain levels ends up being the determining factor. They're like, that's I'm done. That's often the you case. Know, like, You're exactly <laughs> I'm ready, right. doctor. Okay, let's, <laughs> get, let's get this done because mm -hmm. that's you know that's and a good surgeon signs will say leave it to that point you know mm -hmm. say let me know you'll tell me when you're ready or you know say this is going to get worse you can tell me when you're ready but i'm telling you <laughs> you're, right. you're pretty close so yes yeah. and usually that's what it comes to yeah. and, and the patients they know deep down right. when they're ready and because they know how much it affects their life and that's the deciding factor right. so in doing a replacement well we replace the worn ball part and we replace the saucer part. Now occasionally, maybe a patient doesn't have much wear on this part, and we can just replace this part, but for the majority of times... the saucer part is part of a much bigger bone, right? The whole it, scapula exactly. bone. It, so, you, mm -hmm. are you, not the whole thing, just the interior part of that. So people, Just the yeah, part that are, what that we call articulates, that articulates, forms right. the joint okay. where they touch. So the right. rest of the scapula, which would be here, is not affected. Okay. And so we put a metal part on this side, a plastic part on this side, and then you have a, a much uh, more normal in terms of the alignment joint and a nice smooth bearing surface. And what we found with shoulder replacements that it's quite predictable that it really is quite helpful for the pain. Now the function that someone gets after that is very much dependent on the physical therapy afterwards. Okay. And the shoulder is a joint that's very uh, susceptible to fluctuations in physical therapy and rehab. Right. But uh, with but good you have rehabilitation, certain protocols that are oh, absolutely. tested, tried mm. and true to some yes. degree, and then people if they follow certain protocols, you know, they should do very well. They should, they, in theory, they should do well. So mm. obviously, you know, your relationships with not only your own staff internally, but other qualified, you know, physical therapists and re rehabilitation, you know, that communication is very important. Absolutely. So, so how much of the you know, humerus is, is replaced. Is it just a little part of it or is it just, you know, some of it or? So, so how uh, far down do you, <laughs> how far down do you, do you, do you get past uh, the medical detector with that or, is it, or just well, a small little, Well, it depends little, on the know, metal detector. Yeah. Well, if we think of the shoulder kind of the ball at yeah. the top of the humerus bone here, we just sort of remove this part, just the ball part. Oh, just the ball part, okay. Mm -hmm. But we do to share the load of that metal implant, so decrease the wear over time, we place what's called a stem down into the bone of the humerus here. Right. Now we used to place them pretty far down. We can actually have learned through improved technologies, we don't have to go that far down. Right. Um, but uh, there certainly is an extension of the metal down into the bone here, which the patient wouldn't feel. Um, and then in terms of the other side, the saucer or glenoid side, uh, that's uh, just a minimal amount of bone that need, needs to be removed. Okay, so mm -hmm. it is a, you know, it is a lengthy procedure, is it, you know, that is obviously a more invasive procedure, but it's at a, at a means to an end for that Absolutely, patient. Absolutely, yes. And that is, you know, the best the, the best method for someone with an advanced arthritic shoulder. So now there are some technologies, you know, uh, treatments that are sort of in between. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if you're doing for the shoulder, for the knee. Uh, people have heard of like uh, synvisc, orthovisc, different types of hyaluronic, you know, acid. Uh, do you, how does that come into play in between if someone's starting to have arthritis in their knee or their shoulder, are these things that you mm -hmm. incorporate into your practice? Certainly, yes, the, okay. these we incorporate. And it's funny, you, you mentioned sort of in-between options. And uh, to continue a little on the surgical, and then I want to answer yeah. that question, there are other options for shoulder arthritis. There are some that are more involved and even less. So with the less involved, there is some resurfacing, which is a, a hotter topic in orthopedics. It's taking a little bit less bone when we uh, resurface a joint and it's different than replacement. In replacement you have to cut bone and really reshape the whole bone and joint. In resurfacing, and I'll explain, you actually leave the bone intact which keeps more of the natural anatomy of the joint whether it's the shoulder, the knee, hip or other intact. And so this is something that I find useful as uh, someone who practices in shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, sometimes we resurface it. So what does that mean? If someone's saucer glenoid is intact, but the ball part is worn, but not too worn, we're in that kind of that medium zone. The non-operative treatments haven't worked, but a shoulder placement might be too aggressive. So we have an option called resurfacing. And what do we do? We don't cut any bone. We just kind of shave the top of the ball part and put a cap right on it that is specially fixated. And that smooth metal cap can articulate or form a joint with the rest of the shoulder and it maintains the natural anatomy of the shoulder um, and so there's a proper balance with some of the muscles which we recreate with the replacement but here's something that's a lot more natural feeling and can 
be a very good option for someone who has less wear, but maybe is a little younger, maybe in their 40s or early 50s. I was going to ask, maybe it's something where mm -hmm. it's not, you can see early signs of de degeneration, or maybe mm -hmm. there's history or, or whatever it is that you realize that this joint probably will degrade over time, but exactly. if you can catch it early enough, reshape it, give it uh, some more life, maybe. Exactly true. It's hard to predict how long that may resurfacing may last. Maybe there's some, some statistics on that now, if it, if it does last 10 years, 15 years, or it's still kind of early in the game to see where these resurfacing, you know, I know they do it on the hip as well. Of so course. That's why, yeah, so mm -hmm. it's interesting, you know, similar, Same concept. similar joint, um, mm -hmm. you know, to the, uh, in terms of the ball and socket, so. Well, certainly, we're always factoring the longevity of whatever implant we put in. Right. And there's been a lot of data on replacements, hips, knees, uh, shoulders. Uh, we now hope with improved technology, a good 15, 20 years we we're able to achieve. But if you have someone who's in their 40s, you know they might need another procedure. If they're a candidate for the resurfacing, once that wears, let's say, in 20 years, in their 60s, you could do a fresh, not revision, um, standard replacement. So it's a great advantage. Right, so so that's, it's a kind of like a, a gap procedure. It is. Okay. And may, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it buys them enough time and maybe, who knows? Maybe, maybe the, it lasts maybe, forever. Maybe but, the generation yeah. process stops or maybe mm -hmm. they're not as active as they were when they were younger and so they don't have the continual wear and tear of that joint. So there's a lot of factors that go into this stuff. So Absolutely. Uh, and then, you know, we're you know, running short on time because we could talk about these topics forever. <laughs> but, Sounds like it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so what about are these injectable procedures? Where, where, what role do they have, like in the knee? Uh, if someone said, you know, hey, I don't want this procedure, or what's been the research on, on those? So there are multiple different brands out there. Yeah. Basically, they're called, uh, they're made of something called hyaluronate, which is part of the building blocks of our normal cartilage. We call it visco supplementation. When we inject these materials, it's like a gel. So we can inject this material. It's not going to regrow cartilage, but it has some of the building blocks of cartilage. So it can provide the properties of a little cushioning, um, a little lubrication, and a little bit of elasticity that our cartilage normally has. So it can make an arthritic joint feel better. Our data shows that it's most effective in people who have mild to moderate arthritis. The more advanced the arthritis we can expect, the results aren't as good. But it's a, a, a treatment modality that we very commonly try and certainly before an operative uh, treatment. Right, so, so it's an option, pre-operative, yes. see if they get some relief. Mm -hmm. Like you said, if they do it, they get some relief, maybe they do some more you know, rehabilitation with mm -hmm. it, exercise therapy, stretching, maybe condition the body a little bit better, and uh, the combination of all that, that could last pr pretty well for a long time. Yes, a multimodal approach, all those different uh, avenues to help uh, treat a problem that we can't cure arthritis, but we could try to make it feel better, and those are the combination of things that we use. Right. So, you know, we spoke about a lot of different topics. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, your practice must uh, be, you know, you never know what's walking through the door, I guess, because you, mm -hmm. you're dealing with, you know, several, you know, joints and several, uh, you know, sports. But at the end of the day, you are treating, you know, the, the public at large, you know, adolescents, you know, high schoolers, you know, young mm -hmm. people, old people. So, so it's an interesting field and uh, the technologies keep getting better and better. So I think that bodes well for, you know, people that do have an injury, you know, not to worry, just get the proper evaluations. You know, I always tell people in, in our practice, you know, that they should have a, a team behind them. They should know, like, if they have kids playing, you know, lots of sports, you know, they should have a, a go-to doctor. They should have, you know, your name on a speed dial. So if the kid gets injured, they can get in, get the proper evaluation, get the proper treatments and get the proper advice, you know, quickly. Uh, I think it's important these days because a lot of times, you know, even with, you know, we're not going to talk about concussions, but all these things <laughs> pop up all the time and, you know, neck injuries and back injuries and shoulders and knees. Uh, you know, these people need to know that they're, you know, specialists like you in the area that they can uh, call your office and, and get in touch with you and, and, you know, get professional advice. So, um, yeah, I want to thank you. You know, very informative, very, uh, you know, uh, a lot of good information. So thank you very much for being on the show. Welcome. And uh, thank you uh, for watching Health IQ. And we hope to see you at our next uh, show. Thank you. Good night.